Thanks for checking out this movie review video. Uh, yes, these are things that I think I'll start doing. Um, I'm gonna mainly do it as request only. So this one is for The Return of the Living Dead, the 1985 film. And this was requested by YouTube user Uncle Pete. So Uncle Pete, I know you're probably feeling after, after you asked me a few times, have you watched The Return of the Living Dead yet? Have you watched it? I'm sure you felt he's never gonna watch it, but I did. And that's why I'm doing this video to show you, hey, I did, and here are my feelings on it. Uh, so I did a like a slight bit of research. Um, so I'm gonna throw out some interesting things that I found about the film, but also just give my overall breakdown of what I liked and potentially didn't like about the film. And then I'll give it like a star rating out of five stars at the end and let you know how I felt. Uh, but if you have ideas for uh, other films that you would like me to do, a review on go ahead anyone put it in the comments but please subscribe first uh, I'm gonna start doing a thing where I will only um, I only take the the uh, suggestion if you subscribe as well so please hit the subscribe even if you're not planning on putting a suggestion out there hit the subscribe for me it literally takes you like a second and it can help the channel out a lot so um, if you see me continually looking down it's because I actually wrote a bunch of notes because uh, I wanted to make sure that I say everything I wanted to say. Uh, as I was watching the film, I was just kind of putting things down. I actually used to do a movie review podcast for eh, about a year and a half-ish. Uh, it was called Carlin and Jordan's Most Excellent Movie Night. Uh, it's still available, a bunch of the episodes on iTunes. Maybe some other stuff, I'm not sure. But you can look it up if you have interest. But um, that stopped some time ago. But anyway, let me get into this. Let me talk about The Return of the Living Dead from 1985. So this film was based on... Okay, it was written by Dan O'Brien, who also directed it. It was based on a book by John Russo, who worked with George A. Romero on the original Night of the Living Dead. So after that film was over, basically John Russo and George A. Romero kind of split ways, and they both went on to make more zombie films, or be involved with more zombie films, but they were kind of doing them separately, doing their own things. So it was like this kind of release of dual zombie films, which is really cool. Um, directed by Dan O'Brien, like I said. But this is, I think, the only thing of note that he's actually directed. I think he directed only like one other feature-length film after this. So this is pretty much all he's really known for directing-wise. He is a writer, and he's written a bunch of screenplays. And I wrote down uh, the most important ones that people might know. Uh, 1979's Alien, obviously a great one. Uh, 1981's Dead and Buried, which I haven't seen, but I've heard really good things about. I plan to see that. 1985's Life Force, which I've also heard quite good things about and have not seen. I believe it's a vampire or vampire-ish film. And 1990's Total Recall, which I know a lot of people who really like Total Recall. Full disclosure, haven't seen it yet. And this is kind of a theme, like... <laughs> The fact that I haven't seen The Return of the Living Dead until today, right before I started recording this, is crazy. Uh, I know people are out there just like, hold on a second. You proclaim often that you're a huge horror fan, so how have you never seen The Return of the Living Dead? It's because there's so many films out there. And the big thing is I didn't really start getting into watching film until I was in college because when I was living with my parents throughout high school, middle school, and elementary school, they were very, very strict very strict about what I wasn't was not able to watch so once I got to college is when I started you know trying to catch up and I've been trying to catch up ever since there's so many good films that I will eventually watch that I just haven't gotten to yet so this was one so thank you Uncle Pete for making sure I got to this it was on my list I just because of your uh, request I moved it up much quicker so uh, the budget for this film was originally four million dollars it made at the box or office 14.2 million, which is pretty good considering 1985 being the year that this came out. So that's awesome. Uh, like I said, it was based on that novel. Um, as far as directing goes, I like I said, Dan O'Bannon did it, but originally it was supposed to be Toby Hooper who was going to direct it, but he ended up pulling out kind of last minute because he was going to direct Life Force, which Dan O'Bannon wrote the screenplay for, which I thought was a kind of cool tie-in. So at that point, they just kind of approached Dan O'Bannon and were just like, um, do, do you want to give it a shot? Do you want to direct it? And I think he did a good job. I, I think it is directed pretty well. I think the cinematography is solid. So I think it went well. It's kind of weird, though, that uh, Dan O'Bannon then didn't 
really direct much else. Eh, who knows? So I'm just going to go down the list of uh, talking about things as I kind of wrote them down, my thoughts. So the first thing that really struck me in the film is the character of Frank. Oh, by the way, spoilers in this before I go forward. So if you want to watch it first and then come back, whatever. Uh, so the guy who played the, the character of Frank, James Karen, crazy over-the-top acting. <laughs> and at first I was just like, whoa, whoa. This acting is like... Whew aggressively over the top and nutty uh but i kind of looked forward to it after a while i got used to it and it was just like this is like enjoyably bad in my opinion so i was very much looking forward to seeing more of that every time he popped on the screen i was like oh how ridiculous is he gonna be now oh how ridiculous now so i actually hated it at first and then ended up really liking it so i'm sure other people have felt that way uh, interesting thing about James Karen, uh, Karen when they were making the film, originally in the script, his character was supposed to end up turning into a zombie and like going out in in the rain and terrorizing the the city, or at least in the cemetery slash mortuary industrial area. But James Karen did would like vehemently did not want to do any filming in the rain. He did not want to get wet. So he came up with the idea of having his character throw himself in the uh, oven, which honestly, I think it worked. I think that portion of the film worked pretty well, and I guess Dan O'Bannon signed off on it and kind of agreed. He was like, yeah, I mean, we can do that. Sounds good. So, I mean, it ended up working. But at the same time, I was kind of like, when I read that, I was just like, James Cameron was like, oh, I don't want to get wet. It's like, come on. Whatever. Anyway, uh, practical effects were great. Really like the practical effects, especially like that half zombie that was very much skeletal, uh, who they ended up strapping to the um, embalming table and talking to. Uh, really good. Tar Man. Everyone, everyone cites Tar Man, even though he's not like a huge part of the film. I mean, plot-wise, he's a huge part of the film because that's where the initial infection basically comes from. But um, he doesn't have a whole lot of screen time. But his design is really awesome. Like, he looks great. And the fact that he can talk... And actually, the, the zombies can talk at all in this is a really cool thing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. One thing that really hit me about the practical effects. The scene early on when there's that body that they, they cut the head off. And the, the headless body's just kind of like running around aimlessly. I was like, oh man, that's a lot like Reanimator. It just reminded me of Reanimator because that happens in that film. And I, I looked it up and I was just like, both these films are from the same year. Because I was wondering if like one had seen the other and kind of was like, oh, I like that idea and they used it. But it's not, I don't think so. Because both those films came out in 1985. So I just found that kind of like, kind of interesting that they're very similar scenes and concepts and practical effects that were used. And they came out the same year. Just interesting. Uh, the music. The music is really good. Uh, the use of the punk soundtrack, I felt like kept the film kind of light and fun, which I really like that feel of it. it. It's a really good mix of like horror and comedy slash camp. And I don't know, I just, I just really like horror films from the 80s like that. So this was really hitting the kind of sweet spot for me when it comes to that. Like I like comedy, I like horror separately but i also really like the the nice mix of comedy and horror and it can go wrong there are films that i've seen where it definitely goes wrong and it just doesn't work it's either too much on the horror too much on the comedy or they just don't mesh properly but uh there are plenty of films where it does work and the return of the living dead is definitely one where it definitely works and i don't think either of them take away from each other because there definitely are times where you know, you can have too much comedy where it actually takes away from the horror, or too much horror where it takes away from the comedy, it just doesn't land. But I feel like this is integrated in such a way, and I think the soundtrack helps uh, to make sure that those things are symbiotic. So, there's that. Uh, I like the tie-in to Night of the Living Dead. How they were basically saying, I think it was Frank's character was like, oh yeah, the the movie Night of the Living Dead, everything that happened in there is actually true. It was just exaggerated. So I like that tie-in and the fact that Tar Man is basically supposed to have been involved in those true life events, which, I don't know, I just like that. Also the fact that, I think it was Freddy, the character Freddy had uh, referenced the fact that um, 
in the movie, if you take care of the brain, that's supposed to kill the zombie. So that's what they tried, but it doesn't work. So I thought that was also a really nice tie-in. So um, The choices of setting to shoot at, I thought, um, were effective for, what, for the film they were doing, but I also felt like it definitely made sure to keep the budget low. That was just, I mean... When doing my research, I didn't find anything saying that, but just me, you know, staying on, on my toes while I'm watching the film just started thinking, all of these probably would have been very easy to get into and would be super, super cheap for shooting. And if you notice, they didn't really hit a ton of different locations. They, I think they really only had, like, three main locations. It was uh, the uh, industrial building where the medical supply company was, the mortuary and the um the cemetery and they were all supposed to be right there i i don't know if they really were or not uh the other thing to say about setting is that the film's supposed to be done in um louisville kentucky but actually i think only the outside of the cemetery was actually shot there and everything else was done in california which you know really no big surprise there because that's that's something that that film has done for a long time. They'll be like, oh, this is set in this state, but everything was filmed in California. That's common. So, you know, but I just thought that, you know, all those settings probably kept the budget low. Uh, the acid rain twist with the infection uh, of, you know, when the body was, the initial body was burned and then it just goes into the air and it basically took the infection into the air and then rain came down in the rain. And the tie into acid rain was cool, I'm assuming very timely, because Acid Rain, I remember, was something that was really just starting to be talked about in the 80s, so it was very topical. So I kind of like that tie into it. Also, I just think it was a, a cool vehicle for the larger infection that ended up happening. So, And that's one of the things that I think this film did in general, was to bring a bunch of new stuff to the zombie film. Not that it was necessarily needed at this point in time, because... Zomb the zombie genre wasn't mined as heavily as it has been over time, but back then in 1985, like it had been done a little bit, but it, people weren't tired of it at the moment. I don't know about you people, but I am tired of it. I've been tired of it for I don't know at least ten years to be honest. It's just I don't know, but this was refreshing to go back to and be like, oh, this is good. Uh, yeah, so the acid rain really liked. Uh, real quick, I wrote in, my condolences to Linnea Quigley. I felt bad for the fact that she was nude, like, the entire film. Pretty much the entire film. And not to mention that a large part of that, there was rain involved. So she's, like, naked in the rain. She must have been really cold. So I hope that in between scenes, they had very warm, uh, bathrobes for her to be wearing. The other thing is, this is not something that would really be happening nowadays in a horror film as much. I mean, you still have nudity, but back in the 80s and into the 90s, nudity in horror films was a really big thing. It was very acceptable. Everyone really liked it. It was just a different time. Nowadays, that's not really happening. So um, I just thought that, like, Linnea Quigley, what a trooper to go along with that role and put herself in that position. Because there are a lot of people who wouldn't. And I believe I had heard... Uh, on a podcast where she was being interviewed as a uh, Mick Garris's um, postmortem podcast that her mom like vehemently was like, don't do this. Uh, but she ended up doing it anyway. So, or actually I think she was also saying that the, the, there was someone else who was offered that role and their mother found out about the role and was just like, Oh, you're definitely not doing this. So, you know, big ups to her for, you know, being bold, being bold to do it. I'm not sure I could have. Uh, so this, like I was saying before, like the fact that there was a lot of new stuff that came up with zombies, the other big thing was the the eating of brains. This is the film that marked uh, the incorporation into the zombie genre, the idea of them needing to eat brains. And even further, I really like the fact that they kind of developed the zombies as being not quite sympathetic, but like a little bit sympathetic because when they find out when the one, the half one is strapped to the, the um, embalming table basically says, we eat brains because we're in pain, like it hurts. And eating brains is the only thing that, that relieves that pain. It's interesting because we went in a lot of other um, zombie films, especially prior to this one, you don't get that 
understanding. It's just kind of here are the evil things and they're just evil. Like that's just how it is. They're they're reanimated and they they can't really think so much. They're just like primal now and they just eat. They just eat flesh. And that is the thing. Before they just ate flesh. So this is where the brain thing started. And I just like that they had a reasoning behind it. It's a, a, an additional level of development in the story that I really appreciated. So that uh, fun mix of horror and comedy, I already went over that. The, the feelings of the zombies being brought into it, just talked about that. Uh, I liked the, the zombie food delivery service in this film, basically, where they, because they could talk, which I at first was like, I don't know how I feel about the zombies talking, but it ended up being incorporated very well. Uh, that ended up going very, very well for me because I loved every time they were like, send more paramedics or more cops and they just kept coming paramedics cops and you just see them get out of their cars and then mobbed by the zombies and it literally was delivery food delivery for the zombies that's exactly what they're doing and i i don't know if it was intentionally thought of as that but i that's how i viewed it and i thought that was an additional level of comedy to it for that reason and i appreciated it it was fun uh, and then the last thing I have written down here is that the soundtrack, I think I talked about this a little bit, but the soundtrack really helped to keep it fun. Like I was saying, like the mix of horror and the mix of comedy, um, it sometimes actually needs a little bit of help. And the soundtrack really did help with that. The stuff that was not like actual punk music that was just more instrumental was a good mix of like dread and kind of like campy, uh, kitschy horror music. And it just kind of like set the tone for you. It lets you know like, hey, it's there's dread in here and there's horror, but it's also very much kind of light and you should laugh a little bit and just have a good time. So anyway, I don't want to make this like a half an hour or anything like that, but those were all my feelings that I, ha that I wrote down. Uh, and overall, I, like I said, I'm going to give it a star rating out of five. I would give this four out of five stars. Um... It's not a perfect film, obviously, but it is quite good. And considering what it is and what it was going for, I think they accomplished a lot of it. I think they accomplished so much, and I'm glad I finally saw this film. So thank you, Uncle Pete, for recommending it, and I'm happy. We'll have to see what uh, if anyone makes any recommendations coming up that I haven't seen. I'll still rewatch stuff that I have seen if you're putting it in the comments and you subscribe and you say, hey, could you do a review on whatever? Uh, but know that when you ask for that, it might take a week or two for me to get it done because I use um, Netflix DVD service. So they have a really good selection. That's why I still do that. I do the streaming, obviously, and I also do like the Shutter streaming service. But the thing is, I keep the DVD option for Netflix because their library is very good. Because there's a lot of stuff that's not on Blu-ray now or not on streaming services because the streaming services are very limited. So I just like to have that continual option of getting older stuff through DVD option. And that's how I got the Return of the Living Dead because it wasn't available on any streaming services. So, yeah, and I don't own it, but maybe I should now. Anyway, um, but just know that if you make a recommendation, it might take a little bit for me to get it because I have to get rid of whatever DVD I have right now, you know, get the other one sent to me, all that jazz. But thank you for checking this video out. Once again, thank you, Uncle Pete. Hope you're happy with this review. Please comment down here and let me know how you feel about it. And just in general, like, give a little bit of your own review on it. If you want to do a, a video in response to this and give your full review, that would actually be awesome. And if you do, let me know, because I would enjoy that. I'd, I'd watch it. Uh, but everyone, please hit the subscribe. It takes you literally a second. It can be very helpful. And especially if you're going to recommend a movie for a review, put it down there. Hit the subscribe. Also, just comments in general. Likes are fun. I don't think it really does anything, but it's fun. I like hitting that. <laughs> but anyway, thank you everyone for checking this out. And until next time... Keep it brutal. Brains!